Thankfully, you're here for our Wednesday of our family extravaganza. Let's stand as the colors are going to be presented. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. The Pledge to the American Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My country, tis of thee. Ready? My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let free. pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Onward, Christian soldiers. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before, Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. The Pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Good singing. Let's bow for prayer, asking that God will work in a special way today. Lord, we thank, we're so thankful for the blessings you've given already in the first two days of this very special time. Thank you for truth that has gone forth so clearly. Thank you for the open hearts of everyone here to receive truth. Now, Lord, would you work even in this opening assembly. Lord, give us what we need. We commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, what did the organ say? Sit down. Sit down. And you did a good job. Well, I'll let you stay seated as we will continue to learn our theme song. So let's sing it out right from the very first here. We can know that God made everything thing by His spoken word He made creation sing. We can see the heavens tell the glory of the Lord as we rest in faith, trusting His holy word. For in God we trust, here He's the one we rest upon. We can live in victory through Christ alone. Victory through Christ alone, God the one we rest upon. Okay, let 
me hear you now. We can know that Jesus saves us. We can know. Be assured each moment, everywhere we go. We can know our sins are all forgiven, washed away. That our path is leading to God's perfect day. Good job. I think we're learning it, but I think we can do a lot better. So listen for the organ. Oh, well, I think we better practice a little more. Let's listen closely. Okay. Everybody in the back ready? Good job. All right, let's really sing it out. We can know that God made everything living thing. By his spoken word, he made creation sing. We can see the heavens tell the glory of the Lord. As we rest in faith, trusting his holy word for in god we trust he is the one we rest upon we can live in victory through christ alone victory through christ alone god the one we rest upon we can know that jesus saves us we can be assured each moment everywhere we go we can know our sins are all forgiven washed away that our path is leading to god's perfect day good job now while you're still standing Let's go over our theme verses and memorize these here this week. Say it with me, reference first, Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. Good. And then Hebrews, say it with me, Hebrews 11.3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Two great verses. Okay, listen closely. Very good. Well, we're going to now blast off and we're going to now move forward in the story there on the space station. So watch closely. Mission complete, Houston. After I've been in the world for over 30 years, the space center landed. We have a liftoff. One more trip for the One fire for the just don't have taste for space paste. Oh, poor Miss Moon Pie. Can you all join with me in showing Miss Moon Pie some sympathy? On the count of three, say, poor Miss Moon Pie. Ready? One, two, three. Poor oh, Miss Moon Pie. Oh, thank you, boys and girls. That's the nicest thing that anyone's ever said to me. Don't worry, I'll help you. We'll whip up something special for the crew. Okay, later. Uh, Dr. Kepler, thank you so much for allowing us to store our most very valuable cargo in your ship's hold. Oh, Captain Cosmo. Oh, no. Uh, you've never 
told us what was in that canister. I suppose it's top secret, and you'd have to kill me if you ever told me. Or just give me some space paste. Yeah, same thing. That'll kill you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I can matter. tell you, because I need all of your help here on this International Space oh, Station. Certainly. Our crew was on our exploratory mission to Mars. And on our mission, we came across, just under the planet's surface, Ooh. an incredibly rich vein of a very valuable mineral called cranium. <gasps> cranium? But cranium is the most rare element known to mankind. It's very valuable to the scientific world. Why, if we just had a little bit of it here, we could make so many adjustments and great things for humankind. We're taking our sample back to Earth for some analysis. <gasps> but it's very attractive to space pirates. Uh -oh. The black hole bandits would do anything to get their grimy little space hands on our cranium. That's right, we must be well defended in case they show up. That's why I have my trusty laser ray gun. Oh, good. And I got my plasma ray gun. Oh, wonderful. I got my blue pool noodle. Oh, no. Uh, Oswald, a pool noodle that is not a deadly weapon, Half Star. You haven't seen my sister use oh, one, then. <laughs> Captain, don't worry, it's safe in our impenetrable hold. Very and good. Only Robo can unlock it. By the way, where is Robo? I haven't seen him all day, and he's usually on the bridge telling us all what to do. Oh, look, here's the tourists. And they have Robo. Wait, wait a minute. Those aren't tourists. I recognize them from their wanted poster. The it's Black Hole Bandits! Exactly, as advertised. We are the Black Hole Bandits, and we are here for a mission. So, <laughs> back off! Right. Won't you do what we are telling you to do? Hmm? I shall never assist you, never. Move on. The last thing we want to do is hoit ya. But it is on our list. Definitely on our list. <laughs> so, aren't you willing to do us a favor? I'm about to make you a hero. <laughs> I shall never assist you, never. Oh, really? I think you will. <laughs> That's your job. That's your job. You need to assist us. So what are we gonna do about that? Yeah, it's perfectly logical to help us. Do our duty. Indubitably incontrovertible. That's exactly right. No, Robo, don't do it. What are you? What's your name? Say it again. I am this vessel, personal artificial intelligence nanny. I am programmed. Yeah, I already said that. Okay, yes. Boys and girls, do you think that Robo should unlock the impenetrable hole? No, wait, 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 wait. So, so don't manipulate them, okay? So your job is to do what? I must assist in helping this crew perform their duties. Exactly, and our duty is to plunder this ship and take the cranium. So you're gonna assist us, right? It's in our bylaws. You need to make it clear. It's pretty clear. We pay our dues. Yep. Well, when you state it that way, then you are here to help our duty because you are assisting us, right? What? Right? Of course it's right. I must assist them in performing their duties. No. No. Then open it. Yeah. 
Hey, Space Rangers, we gotta get a different plan for this. Let's go and find a place. Do I not see the last of us? You might have taken the cranium, but you can not get rid of me. Okay, all right. Do you think the Black Hole Bandits will come back? Be sure to come back tomorrow and see what happens in our Space Odyssey adventure. All right, boys and girls, did you bring your smile with you this morning? Good to see each and every one of you, and I hope you brought some friends to be with you here at our family extravaganza. Well, we're going to get started this morning for our special time together with our Cosmos Quiz. So you got your thinking caps on here. I think each one of us hopefully has a little bit of that cranium inside our heads. That's so needed. So here is our Cosmos Quiz for the day. According to the timeline recorded by God in the Bible... How old is the earth? How old is the earth? Have you been listening this week? Here are your choices. Is the earth 6,000 years old? Is the earth 600 million years old? Is the earth 60 billion years old? What is our correct answer? I am hearing the word 6,000 years old. In fact, the book of Genesis gives us a genealogy in years from Adam to Noah. Also, the Old Testament records the lifetimes from Noah to David to Jesus Christ. And we can be sure that scripture indicates that we are presently 6,000 years past the day of creation. So that is God created our world out of nothing just about 6,000 years ago. Good thinking here this morning. Well, let's find out this morning our favorite galactic goodies. Thank you very much. And what is your favorite? Well, we've got two to choose from today. I think you'll be interested in these. Here we have our choices. Here is our first choice. Let's see what you think about this one. How about Starburst? Now, do you know where Starburst was first created? It was actually made in England in 1959 with four original uh, flavors. What were they? Strawberry, lemon, orange, and uh, lime. But now you can get tropical, sour, very berry, super fruits, summer blast, and original. So this is a taffy candy. How many of you like Starburst? Let me hear you. Okay. There you got Starburst. Now here is our competitor here this morning. And that is the one-of-a-kind Pop Rocks. Now, Pop, Pop Rocks have a unique something inside of them that no other candy does because inside of them it must have been made in some NASA scientist lab because there is pressurized bubbles of carbon dioxide. And when the moisture of your mouth meets the hard little pop rocks, they explode inside your mouth and fizzle and pop. That's what makes pop rocks work. So this morning, what are you for? How about Starbucks or a Starbucks? <laughs> Hey, how about Starbucks, right? No, okay, all right, all right, how about Starburst? Let me hear you. How about Pop Rocks? Whoa. Oh, come on, we gotta give Starburst one more chance. How about Starburst? Pop Rocks? Wow, that is a very clear win for the carbon dioxide uh, exploding mouth experience there. There you go. All right. Well, now, I want to just tell you a little bit about... Oh, you know what? This is really cool. I found this out. That actually, they have an astronaut food. We talk about that space paste. They actually take real ice cream up onto the space station. Can you believe it? 
And it, you can buy these packets. I don't have any with me, but you can have, they actually have ice cream on the space station. How many of you would like to eat ice cream on the space station? That would be really, really cool. Well, I can't, I can't do that for you, but I can do this for you. I can invite you to have ice cream here at Falls Baptist on Friday night. That's what we're going to do for our Worldview finale on Friday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to serve ice cream and cookies to everyone who comes, rain or shine. We're going to be here for our final presentation by Mr. Tim Chafee. You don't want to miss that. All of the inflatable fair games will be outside as well. So we'll have fun with that after our program here in the auditorium. We've got a special gift for every child. So you've got to bring your parent or bring your grandparent or bring some adult. Beg them and say we've got to get back to our finale on Friday night. Now as we move ahead here I want you to know that every Sunday is very special here at Falls Baptist Church. We have Bible studies for children and for adults, and it all starts at 9 o'clock every Sunday. And this coming Sunday, get a hold of this, on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. As your guest, your dad and granddad get triple weeks content. The moment the first time you'll experience our three creation theater and our science in that yesterday by our NASA scientist Dr. Kuchima. By the way, if you're an adult, you are invited to come back talk Dr. Kojima week service um, and find us at seven o'clock back in here. Also today. So men and you get to meet him um, and he has to say, of course we'll have a fair today and um, um and uh, then in this session in just a moment we're gonna hear from brother uh, Jafey he actually helped put together that encounter and creation in Kentucky. Now, as you can keep inviting friends, and if you get uh, uh, someone to come, make sure you fill out that permission form so we have parents' permission for every guest who comes. And we're so glad you are here. 
So sit up tall and straight for a very, very exciting presentation. All right. Well, it has been our pleasure throughout this week, and we'll be all the way through the finale on Friday night to have Mr. Tim Chafee with us. I'm announcing, I'm giving a little bit of an introduction each time if you're new here so that you can understand his background. Sure, for, attraction, uh, for the attractions at Answers in Genesis. And uh, he oversees the research and writing of content used to develop and explain the many exhibits at the Creation Museum and at the Ark Encounter. And he speaks regularly there. He's the founder of Risen Ministries and he uh, has a blog that is well trafficked and a uh, a uh, podcast and he has a number of books that he has authored. He also writes for the AIG website, Answers Magazine and Answers Research Journal. So it has just been a joy. I've uh, appreciated so much his teaching. So Mr. Chafee, Chafee if you'll come and uh, we look forward to what you have. Let's give him a good welcome here this morning. Thank you Pastor. Well, good morning. Wow, it must not be that good of a morning because you don't sound that excited. You should know the drill. Let's try that one more time and get it right this time. Good morning. Much better. See, it is a good morning, isn't it? You should have some energy and be excited because we're here. We're going to learn about what God has done. We're learning about God's world. That's a great reason to be excited, isn't it? And we get to talk about these things today. Anybody like dinosaurs? Yeah. That's a few people. Anybody else like dinosaurs? Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, I love dinosaurs. Before we get to them, let me tell you real quickly about a couple of the books that are on the back table there. One of them is called God and Cancer. 14 years ago, right now, I was in a hospital in Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, going through chemotherapy and uh, being treated for leukemia. And so I wrote about that experience. But more than that, more importantly, is talking about how uh, through difficulties in our lives, we can still find hope. We can still know that they're the God of love who cares for us. And so I give a lot of biblical examples of how people were able to cling to their faith in God through difficult circumstances. And there's also three chapters that show how the issues of, of death and suffering, all these terrible things in our world, they don't disprove God's existence like a lot of people think. Actually, we can use those to prove God's existence. And so that's what the end is. And if you like historical fiction, uh, if you want to read the official backstory for Noah at the Ark Encounter for Noah and his family, uh, I've got a trilogy of books that I've written called the Remnant Trilogy. And what is that creature right there on the cover? Can anybody see that? A dinosaur. Dino oh, so there are some dinosaurs in this book as well and in this one. So that takes you from the time Noah was a young man up until the time of the flood. And if you want to see what that world might have been like in a family-friendly way, uh, that's what this trilogy is, and it also interacts perfectly with the Ark Encounter. So if you're going through the Ark and you see things that, that they talk about Noah's family or they, they talk about certain things, and you're like, well, that's not necessarily in the Bible because the Bible doesn't tell us everything about that family. If it's not in the Bible, it's from these books. And so they work together seamlessly with the things in the Ark. And uh, I knew what all the props were going to be and all the exhibits, so we wrote those into the story as well. So those are available on the back table there. All right, so let me ask you a question as we get started. Really important date in history, June 11th, 1993. Now, I know the kids, you don't have to worry about this one, you weren't around yet. For those of you who are not kids, who were alive at that time, anybody remember where they were on this extremely important date in history, June 11th, 1993? You weren't around yet, I'm pretty sure. Anybody, nobody knows where they were on that important date in history. Wow, that's amazing. I know exactly where I was. I was in a movie theater right around here, way down toward the front, because that was opening night of this. And that was a really big deal. Why? Because if you were a dinosaur junkie like me and you love dinosaurs and you couldn't get enough of it, this is the very first time that dinosaurs looked real. They were terrifying. They were awesome. They were, they were scary. They were amazing. And they looked like they belonged in the film. Like they were really, like they looked real. And you guys in the front, you're thinking, what are you talking about? Dinosaurs always looked real. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. If you grew up when I did and you wanted to watch dinosaurs on TV, this is the kind of stuff you got. And you'd think that as time goes on, you know, technology gets a little better. So in the 60s, we got something like this. That looks a little better than what we saw on the last screen, right? 
And then again, you think that as we get better and better with computers and technology, you would think that by the 1980s, dinosaurs would be better, right? But no, dinosaurs got a lot worse in the 1980s. Here's what I had to put up with. They look ridiculous. But I am so thankful that I didn't grow up in the 90s because if you were grown up in the 90s as a kid, you know what you got for dinosaurs? That. Isn't that terrible? So dinosaurs are big business. If you put dinosaurs in a movie, you're guaranteed to make millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. You put four of these guys, make $500 million, half a billion dollars, or these movies. Again, over half a billion dollars just in the United States alone because people love dinosaurs, even in movies that look like they're made for kids. You put dinosaurs and they make a lot of money. And you have dinosaurs in all sorts of movies, even a movie about toys, you get dinosaurs, a whole movie about dinosaurs just made for kids. And there's even Land Before Time. Who can forget Land Before Time and all 4,000 sequels that they made? Why do you think they keep making these things? Because they, get money. because they keep making money because people love dinosaurs. And they want more of them. And I love dinosaurs and I want to see more of them. And there are a lot of kids' books about dinosaurs. I mean, there are a lot of kids' books about dinosaurs. A lot really doesn't cover it. There are tons and tons and tons of kids' books about dinosaurs. Let me ask you a question. What do you think the first line in almost every one of these books is? I heard it over there. What is it? Millions of years ago. 65 million years ago. You know what they might as well say? Once upon a time, because you're about to hear a fairy tale. But that is what people are being taught. In fact, if you go to just about any classroom in the United States today and you ask, like kindergartners, when did dinosaurs live? You're going to hear millions of years ago. They've already been told by the time they're four or five years old that the Bible is not true. And it doesn't matter if it's TV shows like that. I mean, this is a lot cuter than Barney. But what do they do in each episode? They talk about a certain dinosaur, talk about how it evolved millions of years ago, and here's all these things. That they're teaching evolution. It's almost like dinosaurs are used as a lure to bring people into a worldview that says, no, God didn't create everything like the Bible says. These things just evolved just by chance. That God wasn't involved. And dinosaurs are an extremely effective tool to get people to think in a way that is contrary to what the Bible says. And so many people have done it. But you know what? Dinosaurs don't have to be used that way. We have dinosaurs at the Creation Museum. Here's from our dinosaur den in, in the Creation Museum. Here's Ebenezer. He's our allosaur fossil. Uh, pretty amazing looking. And we have stegosaurs at the Ark Encounter, and we have pachycephalosaurs at the Ark Encounter. And these are just juveniles. When they get bigger, they're the ones that have the big bony dome on their head. Uh, so they're pretty cool. And I told you yesterday, these are my favorite, the little juvenile T-Rexes. And, you know, dinosaurs come in all shapes and sizes. You know, some can be very small. That's a picture of my son when he was very small. Um, and my daughter when she was pretty small as well. And some of them could be pretty large. My daughter was pretty, pretty naughty that day. So... <laughs> And some of them were just the right size. So dinosaurs come in all shapes and sizes. Let me ask you this question. What is a dinosaur? Because we're going to talk about dinosaurs, so let's make sure we define them, okay? So you think you know you had your hand up first. They're reptiles, but not all reptiles are dinosaurs, right? Nope. So there are only certain kinds of reptiles. What kind of reptiles? They're what? They're big, ginormous animals. Some of them were. Some were huge. Some were actually pretty small. Some of them were only like the size of a chicken. So they're not all huge. Um, real quickly, there, there's a lot of different things that go into this, but here's an easy way to remember it. They are land reptiles, reptiles that live on land, and their legs are underneath their body like this, not out to the side like an alligator or crocodile, okay? If the legs are out like that, that's not a dinosaur. The legs have to be underneath the body. So we're going to do a little quiz here. And the answer is going to be either dinosaur or not a dinosaur. You guys ready? I know the kids are ready. Adults, are you ready? Dinosaur, not a dinosaur? Okay, so we're going to go through several slides here, and you tell me, dinosaur or not a dinosaur? How about triceratops? Dinosaur! How come I only heard the kids on that one? Come on, adults. Kids know more about uh, dinosaurs than adults. That's true. Kids know a lot more about dinosaurs than adults. <laughs> or people who are adults that act like kids, you know. All right, and how about this one, Dimitrodon? Where are the legs? 
not a dinosaur. Now, this, is in, this one's in almost every dinosaur book, but it's not a dinosaur. This is technically called a synapsid. Um, how about this one, Velociraptor? <laughs> dinosaur. Did you notice these Velociraptors? They're only about this tall. And that's fully grown. But you see, I know you guys would never watch the movie like Jurassic Park like I did, but I did it for, I did it for research. Okay, I only did it because of research. Um, <laughs> but velociraptors in those movies are this tall, and they're really scary, but you know what? We don't ever find fossils of velociraptor that big. They're only about this big and about this long. They used a different dinosaur as the model for the velociraptor, but they liked the name velociraptor, so they kept it as that name. But it's based on a different dinosaur. All right, how about this one, Pachycephalosaur? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, not Pachycephalosaur, Parasaurolophus. That's my wife's favorite. How can I get that one wrong? Dinosaur. That is a dinosaur, okay? Dinosaur. It's not the coolest dinosaur, but my wife thinks it is, so we'll let her keep thinking that. How about this one, Mosasaur? Dinosaur. Not a dinosaur. This one lives in the water. It's not a land reptile. How about this one, the coolest bird other than hummingbirds? It's called a harpy eagle. It is not a dinosaur. Now, today, a lot of scientists would say, no, no, that is a, that's called an avian dinosaur. They've reclassified things. But um, the birds are, as we're going to see, are not related to dinosaurs, but that's a common belief today. Uh, but that bird is really cool. Uh, how about T-Rex? Okay. If, if you got that one wrong, you can just go home, okay? <laughs> Everybody knows that one. All right, how about this one, Pteranodon? Not a dinosaur. He's a no, the P is silent. It's pteranodon. So you don't say the P. All right. Um, so the, uh, this, one is, uh, this one is a flying reptile, not a land reptile. How about stegosaur? Dinosaur. Dinosaur. Yep. That one, the picture looks a little weird. It looks like his legs might be out to the side, but they're actually under the body. Yeah, that, you guys did pretty good. At least the kids did. I didn't hear the adults <laughs> talking about this one. At least not very much. Maybe they were just too loud up here. Were you participating back there? Yeah, one person was? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So let me ask you this question, because this is one that we get all the time. How do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? Isn't that an important question? Do you think it's important for us to know the answer to that question? Okay, you ready for this? You don't. You don't take man's ideas about the past of millions and millions and millions of years full of evolution and all this death and suffering for millions and millions of years and then try to squeeze that into the Bible. What you need to do is start from the Bible and use that to explain dinosaurs. And so that's what we're going to do. So when we start from the Bible, can we explain dinosaurs? Well, we're going to talk about that biblical worldview like we talked about yesterday. You guys remember the seven C's? Yeah. What are they? Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, consummation. Great job. Again, I couldn't hear the adults participating, but kids, you're doing a great job. So let's start from the Bible and see what it says. And God said, this is on day six, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And, so it, w and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. Were dinosaurs land animals? What day did God make land animals? Day six. So when were dinosaurs made? Day six. What else was made on day six? People. Adam and Eve were made on day six. So they were made on the same day as dinosaurs and all the other land animals. Nope, dinosaurs did not eat them. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's take a look at this guy. What is this one? T-Rex. Everybody knows T-Rex. Look at his teeth. Do you know how big they were? They could be about seven inches long. They're like these, a mouthful of daggers. So, what do you think this creature originally ate? People. <laughs> Who would say originally he was a carnivore, a meat eater? Anybody say meat eater? Okay. Who would say he was a scavenger? Kind of like, you know, see crows, you know, picking at things on the road, eating dead things. Who says scavenger? Okay. Who says that he was an herbivore, he ate vegetation? Who says he was an omnivore, all of the above? And my favorite, he's an anivore. He's a T-Rex. He can eat whatever he wants. Who in the world is going to tell him what he can or can't eat? Oh, you know, there's one who can tell him what he can or can't eat. And that's, that's the one who made him. And what does he say? And to every beast of the earth, that would include dinosaurs, right? 
to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. What did T-Rex originally eat according to the Bible? Vegetation. Originally, all creatures were vegetarian. So T-Rex originally would have, been, would have been vegetarian. People say, but that's crazy. I mean, look at those really sharp teeth. You know what? When you find a fossil that has sharp teeth, you know what you've discovered? A fossil that has sharp teeth. It doesn't necessarily tell you what it ate. It might provide some clues, but it doesn't prove that it ate meat. For example, take a look at this creature. That one's got some pretty sharp teeth, doesn't it? You know what it uses those sharp teeth for? For tearing into the flesh of unsuspecting fruit. Because that is a fruit bat skull. Now have a look at this guy who obviously needs a trip to the dentist. He's got some pretty sharp teeth, doesn't he? What do you think he uses them for? Well, mostly for nuts and fruit and vegetation. Now, how about those creatures that we talked about the other day that are called bears that we in Wisconsin aren't really necessarily big fans of, at least not during football season? He's got pretty sharp teeth too, doesn't he? Now, a lot of times we think of bears eating like the salmon. We think of them standing by the waterfall and catching salmon. But you know what they eat most of the year? Berries and other things that they can find in the forest. A lot of times they're not eating meat. Look at the polar bears. Now, again, you, oftentimes you think of them eating some meat, like seals and those kind of things. But look at the skulls of these polar bears that I took at the San Diego Zoo last year. Sharp teeth, right? Well, here's what SeaWorld says their polar bears eat. A variety of red meat. Now look at all the rest of the things. Lettuce, apples, oranges, broccoli, sweet potatoes, celery, tomatoes, carrots, grapes, watermelon, rockmelon, barley, crack corn, and the naughty ones get cod liver oil. <laughs> those of you who are my age and older know what I'm talking about. And all the guys in this room can raise their hand and say, yep, I've had that. You were laughing, I bet you, yep, I knew it. <laughs> so what, most of those are not meat. So just because a creature has sharp teeth, it doesn't mean that it ate meat, it just means that it had sharp teeth. And it depends on your worldview and your starting point that tells you what, how you interpret that data. So again, using that seven seeds of creation, we start from the Bible and we see that originally those creatures were vegetarian and then something happened that changed all of that. So how about this? Does the Bible mention dinosaurs? It doesn't use the word dinosaur at all, but it does talk about this creature called the behemoth in Job 40, verse 15. In Job 39, in the beginning of Job 40, God is describing all these creatures as Job, saying, hey, look at the ostrich, look at the, the horse, look at these creatures, look how amazing they are and what the things they can do. And then he says, behold now the behemoth, which I made with thee. It almost sounds like God says I made this creature on the same day, doesn't it? He eateth grass like an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. What is a cedar? It's a big tree, okay? Especially in that area of the world. It's a really big tree. So he moves his tail like a cedar. You know what? If you look in a lot of study Bibles, they'll have a little note that says this is probably the hippopotamus or the elephant. Well, let's take a look. There's a cedar on the left. <laughs> There's the hippopotamus on the right. Does that look like a cedar tree to you? Would anybody ever think of that as being a cedar? No, that's ridiculous. How about the elephant? Now, the elephant's tail is a little more impressive, but it's more like a horse tail, okay? It's not really that impressive. Nobody's going to think of that as being a cedar tree, but there is one creature we know of that fits this description perfectly, and that is the sauropod dinosaur, the long-necked, long-tailed creature. That one has a tail like a cedar tree, and that fits the description perfectly. It even goes on and says that bones are a strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. Why do you think it says that? I think it means he has really strong bones. They're really thick. They're really big. Here is one backbone from an Argentinosaurus. One backbone. What do you think that means about that creature, that he is really, really huge? Yeah, they estimate he could be anywhere up to 85 tons. And if you look really closely, Underneath the, underneath the front of the creature, behind that, that bush, there's a person waving like that. That tells you how big Argentinosaurus could have been. Just this massive creature. But some people look at the elephant and say, no, no, that word that says he moves his tail like a cedar, that really could be translated as trunk, even though it's not translated as trunk anywhere. Um, but they'll say it could be trunk, so maybe it's talking about the elephant trunk. Now, elephant's trunk is really cool, isn't it? 
It can weigh about 200 pounds. That's pretty big. It can use it for all sorts of things. It feeds itself, it, you know, and it can give itself a shower. I mean, it's just really, really cool. But it's not an elephant. How do we know? Well, look what else, look what else this passage says. He is the first of the ways of God. It's like this is the largest land animal God ever made. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth, though he takes it in his eyes, or one pierces his, what's that word? What is it? What does an elephant not have? A nose. A nose. It's not an elephant. It's a different creature, and the only creature we know of that fits that description perfectly is the sauropod dinosaur. So God is saying, Job, look at this amazing creature. Can you do all the things I can do? Obviously not. Okay, so stop trying to demand an answer from me. I don't have to give you an answer. That's really what's going on there. But why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Well, because the word dinosaur didn't come along until 1841, and some of our first English translations were being translated back in the, the 1500s and the 1600s. The King James Version, which is used here, was translated over 400 years ago. The word dinosaur didn't even exist at that point. Do you find the word email in your Bible? No. Do you find cell phone in your Bible or texting you? No, that, those things weren't around yet, so you're not going to have that. So the word dinosaur wasn't too, until 230 years later when Sir Richard Owen said, let's make a term for this iguanodon that we found and these other cool uh, fossils that we're finding. And they, th this word means terrible lizard. So you guys have questions. Let me, I've got a lot to get through. Can, if I have time at the end, can I answer them then? All right. So how about this creature in the very next chapter, Job 41, it says, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? What is the Leviathan? Hmm. Well, it goes on, it says, Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke as of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. What does that sound like? It sounds like a dragon, doesn't it? Something maybe like this? No, probably not like that. That's too cute. How about something like this? Come on. There it is. Uh, no, that's, prob that's probably too much fairy tale and all that. That's too scary. That's not anything like what we're talking about. But that's not scary. It would be if you saw it in real life. So when we talk about this creature Leviathan and it talks about it, it seems like it breathes fire and that kind of thing, people will say, that's ridiculous. Evolutionists will say, that's ridiculous. There's no such thing as a dinosaur that breathed, breathed fire. How do you know? Were you around to see if they were able to do that? All we find are their fossils and they don't preserve any of the soft parts usually. They just preserve the bones. So how would you know what they can or can't do? Let me ask you a question. If all you ever found of the bombardier beetle, how many of you have heard of the bombardier beetle? Any kids ever heard of that before? I should have shown you a video because they're pretty amazing. Um, it's a one inch long little insect, okay? Just one inch long. And you know what it can do? It has these chambers in its backside, like inside its body, uh, where in one chamber it mixes two different chemicals, in another chamber it mixes two more chemicals, and then it has these little tubes that it can aim and shoot out the back. And it blasts those two chemicals from one side and two chemicals from the other. And when they collide in the air, you know what happens? you get an explosion at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the boiling temperature of water at sea level. And so it really does kind of shoot fire out of its backside. And you can watch videos on this of YouTube of like a praying mantis trying to eat one of these things and gets a, a face full of fire. Or you can watch a frog swallow one and then a few minutes later has to spit it back up because the thing blasted fire in its belly. Um, so it's pretty amazing. So if all you ever had of the, was the fossil of this creature, would you ever imagine it could do something like that? No. Of course not. But isn't it possible that God could have made a creature that could do that from the front? Yes. Sure. And it sounds like that's what it says about Leviathan. Well, what was the Leviathan? It says, when he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. So you can't really hold him with a cage or anything. He's just way too big and powerful. It, he's uh, big enough to scare the people who are mighty. Some people think it was maybe something like the Sarcosuchus, which is a 40-foot-long crocodile-type creature. So some people think it was maybe something like the Mosasaur or the Chronosaur. But you know what? It's kind of weird to think of a fire-breathing creature that's just in the water, isn't it? Now, it does talk about Leviathan being in the water, but it also talks about him raising himself up. It talks about him, it talks about leaving pointed marks in the mud or in the mire, which sounds like it comes up on land too. So we're not really sure what kind of creature Leviathan was, but we can be sure that it was pretty terrifying and that it was something that, that God could control, but other people could not, that people could not. 
So is it possible that what we call dragons today, because have you ever heard there were dragon legends in the past? Is it possible that some of those were called dinosaurs? We're going to look at that in just a little bit. But first, we need to ask this question. Did dinosaurs evolve into birds? This is something that is... Okay, that's the right answer. No, they did not. Okay, let's move on. Uh, but that's very popular. Take a look. Here's from Jurassic Park and the first three movies. The first two, or the first two movies showed Velociraptor like the one on the left. The third movie, which was all about how Velociraptor is so much like a bird, everything about it, they're trying to teach that it, came, that it evolved into birds. Look at how they looked in the third movie. Notice the quills on the back of the head. Notice all the extra coloring and everything. They're trying to push this idea that dinosaurs evolved into birds. And there are a lot of books out there for kids about feathered dinosaurs. Now, there is a big debate out there among, even within creationist circles, that say, yes, some dinosaurs had birds. Other people say, no, they didn't have, or had birds. Dinosaurs had feathers, and some people say, no, they didn't have feathers. And there's debate about that. But let me ask you a question. If we find a fossil of a dinosaur, that's legitim a legitimate fossil, a real one, not a fake one like sometimes we get out of China and things like that. There have been a lot of frauds. But let's say we find a real fossil of a real dinosaur that had feathers. Would that prove evolution? No. It would just, we could say, no, God just made some dinosaurs with feathers. Does he have to make things the way we want him to make things? Let me ask you this question. If you had never seen a dolphin or a porpoise or a whale, you know, these big marine, rep, marine mammals, if we had never seen those before, but one day you dug up the fossil of a whale, and you knew there were fish in the sea, and you knew this creature obviously was in the sea, because you could see the flippers, that kind of thing, if you were recreating it for a museum, what kind of skin, what would you put on the outside of it? What would it be? Scales, scales because that's what's in the water, right? The fish have scales, and that, that's what you would imagine, but you would be wrong. They don't have scales. They're mammals. So even if we were to find something like that, it wouldn't prove evolution at all. But there is a debate whether or not we ever find them. Now, can you imagine the first dinosaur trying to fly? <laughs> It's not going to work out very well, okay? Because they don't have all the tools. It's not a matter of just adding feathers. You have to go from like solid bones down to hollow bones, you, uh, mostly solid to mostly hollow. Um, you have to, there's all sorts of changes that have to take place to the anatomy and to the different systems in the body. And you have to go from a creature that's pretty heavy to something that's very, very light. Um, and, and you also have to change from something like scales or uh, a lot of dinosaurs that have what's called scoots. Uh, which are kind of like scales, sort of like a scaly armor type of thing, to something like a feather. Now, here is what scales look like under the microscope on the top left, feathers under the microscope on the bottom left, and when you zoom in a little more on the feathers, look at all the little detail, all the little hooks and barbules and everything that are in there. They're so different than scales or scoots. They're completely different, and it's impossible to go from one to the other because those creatures don't have the genetic information. They don't have the DNA to grow the wings with feathers and all the other things. Because they don't have the DNA to produce a body that's going to be able to fly. You can't add that new information. Evolution can't do that. The whole idea of dinosaurs evolving the birds, it's impossible. And we're not the only ones who say it. Creations aren't the only ones who say it. Here is Alan Fiducia, who is one of the world-leading experts on birds. And he's an evolutionist, and he says this. In spite of some paleontologist's desperate pleas for us to accept through faith... The, the evolutionists want them to believe through faith the dinosaurian origin of avian flight, the details of the origin of birds remain elusive after more than 150 years. They've been looking for proof for 150 years. They haven't found it yet. That's different than what we're told in textbooks all the time, isn't it? So what happened to the dinosaurs? They were made on day six. Well, there's a lot of different theories about how they died off, assuming that they're extinct. Some people think that they died of, you know, a plague. Some people think they were overeating. There was no food left, so they, they starved to death. Some people think all sorts of different natural disasters. The most common one is that, allegedly 65 million years ago, an asteroid or a comet struck the Yucatan Peninsula, and it created so much, uh, such uh, conditions on the Earth that it wiped out all the large creatures like dinosaurs and they didn't survive and then only like smaller mammals survived. That's the theory that is what's in most textbooks and out there in uh, the media. But um, when you go to the different displays that they have in museums and stuff, uh, they give you a lot of different theories like we talked about before. This one was from the Milwaukee Public Museum from about 16 years ago when I brought my students there. And it goes through all sorts of different possibilities of what might have happened to them. But we know what did happen to them. The Bible tells us that God 
sent two of every kind of land-dependent animal to Noah and seven or seven pairs of others, but um, that would include dinosaurs. And the, so there were representatives of the dinosaurs on the ark, but what happened to the ones that weren't in the ark? They died, and they would have been buried in sediments, and then many of them would become fossils at some point. So what happened to the dinosaurs? They died. But there were some on the ark. So what happened to them afterwards? Well, a different environment afterwards. Maybe they didn't have the types of food they needed. Maybe because there was probably an ice age right after the flood caused by the flood. Large reptiles would struggle to survive during an ice age. And so they wouldn't, they wouldn't have multiplied as much as some of the other animals did. They wouldn't thrive. They could be hunted by people. They could be hunted by other creatures. They might have died of diseases or other genetic problems or other catastrophes. There's lots of things that could have happened to dinosaurs and probably some of each of these. So the question about were dinosaurs dragons, let's come back to that one what people call dragons. We have dragon legends from all over the world. Cultures all around the globe have, creatures, have talk about these creatures in their past that they call dragons. And a lot of times they sound very similar to what, the, what we call dinosaurs. Uh, you can read it at the Creation Museum. We have an exhibit called Dragon Legends. You can read about St. George and the dragon, Beowulf and the dragon, some of the other ones that are out there. Even the Chinese, uh, they have like every 12 years they go through, this is the year of the, the dog, the year of the boar, the year of the rat, all these real animals, then they have the year of the dragon. Do they just want a really fake animal to go with the 11 real ones that they got? Or you can go down to Peru and you can see evidence of the moche, moche culture where they have dragons painted on all sorts of their pottery. Or you can go to the Tapram Temple, which is part of the Angkor Wat complex in Cambodia, in southeastern Asia, and you can look at this little thing. See where that red arrow is? If we zoom in to what this guy's pointing at, what does that look like? That looks like Stegosaurus. You know when that was carved? 800 years ago, right around 1200 A.D., they didn't have museums where they can go and look at these. So how did the artist know what that looked like? Maybe they saw them. Or you can go out west. This is in Utah. This is a petroglyph that's carved there at, Nat at Natural Bridges. Or you can go on the top. There's another one there. On the bottom, that one's from the Amazon. You can see a bunch of hunters around a large creature with a long neck, long tail, and four legs. It looks like a sauropod dinosaur. Or you can go to the UK. Uh, in Scotland, this is Carlisle Cathedral. And if you get special permission to look underneath the, the rug here, uh, you get to see the crypt of Bishop Richard Bell. You know what they used to do in the churches? They would bury the pastor in the, in the floor. Pastor, does that sound okay? <laughs> kind of weird. You won't, I don't know that you'd really care at that point. You'd be... <laughs> uh, but it would be kind of weird. And so that's what they used to do. And uh, on this ring all the way around this crypt, you know what they have carved into there? Animals like snakes and dogs and a bunch of other animals we recognize. And then they have these creatures. One of them has, uh, the one on the bottom has three horns on its head. The, one, the other two there have long necks, long tails, four legs, look kind of like sauropod dinosaurs. And these were carved about 500 years ago, right around the time of Christopher Columbus. That's when Bishop Richard Bell lived. How did they see these things? You know, in the UK, they, all of these different towns have dragon legends. They're all over the place in the UK as far as the legends go. Now, I'm not saying every single one of the legends is right. I'm not saying that they're all completely true and we've got to believe everything they say. But why do they keep talking about these creatures in so many places that sound a lot like dinosaurs? I think it's because those people saw them in many cases. And it's because the evolutionary story is false. See, the evolutionists can't explain it. And I have a really funny video clip that if we had time, I would share it with you where they try to explain it. And it's, it's pretty bizarre. They say it's just leftovers of our evolutionary ancestries, that it's like, uh, you know, he comes up with a bizarre conclusion to try to explain why these cultures have dragon legends all over. But you know what's really happening? It's those two worldviews that we've talked about before. Okay, remember what a worldview is? Anybody know? It's the way that you view the world. That's not too hard to remember, is it? It's that set of glasses that you have on that you see everything through. It's the, the, the filter you have on your ears that you hear. You understand everything through that worldview. And for us, we want that to be the Bible. We want that to be God's word. But there are other people who don't start from the Bible, and so they see things differently. So we look at the same rocks, the same trees. We have the same dinosaurs that we look at, the same fossils. And we reach different conclusions because we have different starting points. For example, back in the year 2005, this was discovered by Dr. Mary Schweitzer and her team. This is from the upper leg bone, of the femur, of a tyrannosaur. And they found soft tissue in there. The reason, that, and right away people said, no, 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 you didn't find that, that that's contamination, you gotta do the testing again, and they did. And guess what they found? Soft tissue. And they found what looked like blood vessels and red blood cells. 
don't worry, they didn't have enough DNA or anything like that to redo Jurassic Park. You don't have to worry about those things being recreated or anything. That's not, at this point, that's not happening. But you know why that's important? Because for a long time, the evolutionists said, we'll never find anything like this because this stuff can't last for more than 10,000 years. Well, guess what we found? And since then, they started breaking open other dinosaur bones, and guess what they find? In a whole bunch of them, they find soft tissue. What would that mean? Well, if we were to believe what they said before, that they can't last for more than 10,000 10, years, that would mean these bones aren't more than 10,000 years, right? And we would say, amen. That's just consistent with what the Bible teaches. You know what they say now? Oh, there must be some unknown mechanism that would preserve this stuff for 65 million years. You see, they don't question the millions of years because that is the foundation of their worldview. If the 65 million years goes bye-bye, their worldview collapses, what's the alternative? God made everything in six days about 6,000 years ago, and some of the evolutionists say that is unthinkable. They don't want to consider that because if God made us, then who sets the rules? Let's try that again. If God made us, who sets the rules? God does, okay? And he's the one who gets to judge and say what's right or wrong. But a lot of people don't like that. They don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to live their lives according to the standard that the Creator has set for them, even though his rules are good and right and therefore are, therefore are good to follow those things. So real quickly, let's review as we finish up. We're going to use seven, like we did the seven seeds, we're going to use seven words that begin with the letter F to talk about dinosaurs. First, they were formed on day six. The land animals were on day six. And at that time, you didn't have to be afraid of them because originally they were vegetarian, right? So you didn't have to be afraid. But after Adam and Eve sinned, maybe you don't want to run into a T-Rex on your way home from work because now there's a fallen world. And then God judged the world with a flood and many of them drowned in the flood except for the ones that were on board the ark and many of them became fossils. And as time went on and there were fewer and fewer of them, they faded from memory. And yet you have these legends that persist all around the globe called dragon legends. And around 1800, we started to find these bones in the ground, these fossils in the ground. And people started to put them together into museums and then they attached this, this whole fiction, this story to it that goes something like this. Millions of years ago, these creatures ruled the earth for 180 million years or 200 million years and then they evolved into birds. All, all the, this fiction that goes with it. But see, I want to add one more word that begins with the letter F to that. And that's the word fulfilling. I want dinosaurs to be fulfilling their God-given purpose. And what is that? Well, if the heavens can declare the glory of God... When we look at the, the universe, when we look at all that God has made, we are in awe of what God has done. When we look at something like the hummingbird, this tiny little bird, and you can see all the incredible things it can do that no other creature can do. I mean, they're just spectacular. You look at it and you're just marveling at what God can do. When you look at the human body and all the things that God has done with that, we're just amazed at what he's done. What do you think he was doing with Job? Job, look at this creature. He was showing how powerful he is. He was showing us that we can use these creatures to declare the glory of God. So dinosaurs should be used as missionary lizards. We should be using them to point people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we should be using dinosaurs for. Everything that God has made, we can look at and see that there is a powerful creator, just like Romans 1.20 tells us. And then we should be using these things to point people to that creator. And his name is... Jesus Christ. And he's the one who came down to this earth and he took our place on the cross. And then three days later, he rose from the grave and he offers eternal life to all those who believe in him. Isn't that a great way to talk about dinosaurs? So, all right. Pastor? All right. That was great, wasn't it? You learned a lot today, and we appreciate that so much. And we'll look forward to the next two days, and then remember on Friday night. You don't want to miss that. All right, at this time, uh, let's have uh, the all the junior age. When, when I dismiss in a moment, you go down that aisle there, go out that door, and then these other doors, our adults can go uh, to the three D. Theater down the east hallway here, and all of the primary young people, you need to stay seated. So, have a wonderful day today. We'll ask God to bless in a very special way. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.